Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have all of the SINE FE TI types. So that would be the ISFJ, ESFJ, ENTP, and INTP. And we're here today to talk about the similarities and differences between the types that share the same cognitive functions. So Roger, could you tell us a bit about you? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I'm an ISFJ. I studied uh, MBTI for quite a few years now since college. So um, probably like around seven, eight years has been really into MBTI. Uh, from there, moved on to Enneagram as well, try to learn a little bit more on there. Um, and just since then, it's just been a really fun theory, a really interesting thing to be able to understand others and to understand myself. And yeah, currently I'm a student in a clinical PsyD program. So I've just been <laughs> just been studying and reading. Very cool. Roger is also the admin of the ISFJ Haven group on Facebook. So I'll have that linked below. And so Jonathan, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Uh, yeah, I'm Jonathan. I'm an ESFJ. Um, I got into typology by falling over backwards into it because my wife is a is a is a profiling coach and teacher. And so she uh, she started by teaching me all about it. And so it's become a common language at our house and a way to understand ourselves and our kids and the people we work with and we're around. Um, and yeah, so I guess I've been learning about it for the last you know three or four years. Yeah, we're here to bring you down the rabbit hole of type. <laughs> And Amanda? Uh, I'm Amanda. I'm an ENTP. Um, been into type last five something years. Um, and I love it, obviously. And um, let's see, I've got two kids, married to an ISFP, speech pathologist. I guess. And Amanda's also a part of our certification class at Personality Hacker. And Spacey? I'm Spacey, I'm an INTP. Uh, I've been researching and discussing typology for, I guess, like six or seven years now. Um, I work as a maintenance technician. Um, I offer typing sessions to people because I guess I'm just trying to see if I can somehow figure out or learn uh, how to uh, figure out what type people are more easily and accurately. Rad, rad. And so, hi, my name is Joyce and I'm a certified MBTI master practitioner and I facilitate the instrument in organizations. I also help people on the discovery process of figuring out their best fit type and I coach people. All right, all right, all right. I'm wondering about the shared commonalities or differences between these types. We're basically supposed to enjoy kind of like a chill, laid back, jovial atmosphere where everyone's welcome and you can just have kind of fun, lighthearted conversations about whatever sort of stuff we want. My, my guess is those type of stereotypes usually come from the interplay between the F-E-N-E Right, because we're talking about how we interact with the real world at this point in time. So the extroverted functions are the ones that are going to come into play. And I, you know, though that probably is overly stereotyped about these types, right? Being laid back and just liking to chill, you know, with the friends and stuff. But it probably is a good fit, right? Because when there's some cognizance of the need for group dynamic and the need for people to belong, which is going to be that FE piece, whether it's in you know, the front, whether it's, you know, it's, it's a leading function or e even it's in the back, assuming people are in a good place, right? And, but then you add the NE to that, it, it, it adds a lot of openness, right, to that piece. So now you're, you're engaging with people in the real world. And there is this idea that you're open to people being different than you and saying different things. And it's fun to play off of that particular piece. Now, some of us are going to be more socially introverted or extroverted based on that. But there's still there I that that openness is kind of where that laid backness comes. And I think that really the any is what feeds that that piece. Yeah, there is a certain moldable quality to NE, especially paired with FE. I prefer open to moldable. Just gonna put that out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think like 
I mean, because it, it's perceiving function, right? So like that we're just getting more information, getting more information. So it definitely lends to the to the openness. Um, I I um, as far as like just commonalities between like the people that I actually know who are ISFJ, ESFJ, INTP, um, the FE. Like I, I feel the connection with the FE because because we share that that um, understanding. Even for for my INTP friends, it's still, you know, it might not be as prevalent, but it's still there, and um, it's it's a little bit more relatable than like some of my FI friends because we're we're using that same feel the same type of the feeling function. I'll posit a hypothesis and feel free to shut it down if it doesn't match your experiences. So back to the open versus moldable. So I think it's the extroverted intuition that is open. So as an NE lead type, you're going to relate to the more open aspect. I find SFJs, so with FE at the first or the second slot, I would actually use a word similar to multiple. Maybe multiple has a weird connotation with it, but I'm talking about the word without the weird connotation because FE, it has a very chameleon aspect, especially when it's paired with NE, but it's more FE front seat. So in the SFJs, I find that they do tend to sometimes mold to people's preferences, almost like, you know, Jonathan learning about the MBTI because Someone close to him loved the MBTI. So I consider that a kind of chameleoning or molding to the external environment. Whereas maybe an NTP type doesn't do it as much as the SFJ. I don't know. <laughs> I could be wrong. I guess not as much, but I would say more importantly, less consciously. Less consciously is a good way of clean slicing it, Spacey. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. I like that a lot because like, I feel like as I've gotten more grounded in myself and more mature, as mature as an ENTP can get, um, like, I feel like it's almost my job not to be as moldable. Whereas before I was like, oh, they're into this. This sounds fun. Let, let's do this. Like, I don't care. Like, just kind of pushing back that it doesn't make sense, um, even though it's going to bug my brain. Um, now I feel like I'm like, no, that doesn't make sense. I don't need to mold to that. That's, that's not my job. Um, so I like, I like what you said, Sp Spacey, about the, the less conscious. Cause I, I feel like, um, if I'm not aware and pushing into the, the TI, um, then I, I can be a little bit, I don't like that side of it, but, um, I can be more multiple. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely the case. Certainly from my experience being FE Dom, I, I don't I don't even think about it. People have to point out to me that I'm doing it. Whereas I would imagine if you're, you know, tertiary FE, it's probably a more cognitive type of decision that you're making, uh, you know, in a group as far as, you know, being able to to change yourself or your preferences, if you will, in a in a group. Yeah, I think I feel like, uh, at least for ISFJs, you're kind of onto something, Joyce. Um, I know that with a lot of ISFJs, obviously not to all, but a lot of us tend to be very hesitant when it comes to to new experiences or to being open versus moldable. If we're in a group and the majority of the people in the group are willing to do something, we're probably more likely to just go through with it anyway, just because everybody else feels that way. Even though inside we're like not really wanting to, we'll still go through it. So I feel like there is something to that. And obviously with ISFJs that are a little bit more mature and more understanding of their own selves, we'll understand those boundaries and will understand themselves that <laughs> new experiences, new things, being open to that is not a bad thing. It's just whatever the, that person is comfortable with or not. So I like that analogy a lot, Joyce. What are some other ways FE any can show up? How does it show up in your function stack? Because I'm curious about how the, the same functions play out differently with each of these types. And since we're on the topic of F E N E, I'm wondering how everyone here experiences their F E N E. Well, I think that as an F E driver, like I said, I'm not very cognizant of how F E acts, 
in in my life, but I'm very cognizant of how any does. And as you know, sitting you know as a as the third function down at, at that point in time, that that usually tends to be where I engage for for play or recreation more than for getting things done. Um, and so what I find the relationship between the two are is that that's that's the fun people time is the N E F E stuff. It's the that's where that openness comes for an ESFJ um, and and willing to try new experiences with people like I would never jump off a bridge on my own, but I might go do something, you know, that that would be different or than I you know that I would normally do if people are involved, certainly watching a new movie um, or something like that. Um, it's always anchored right in my case with my SI, but that that's where I see that. Right. That's that's the play. That's the fun interaction for me. But when it comes to getting things done, um, the any has less bearing um, on that particular piece when when I'm working in a group and I think my SI tends to step in more in those cases. Yeah, when you mention your SI grounding you, when you mentioned the role of your SI, could you explain a little bit further about how you SI or how it shows up? Sure, the, 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 really the SI comes into play where, um, well, it first of all, it, it anchors my FE in that it sets up what are the social norms based upon my experience and what is what is mankind, what's the culture, right? What have, what have the people done around us and what's normal and what's not? Um, and so that 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 anchors down my my FE because now I've got rules that come into play as I am bringing people together and I'm interacting and I'm building relationships and connection and stuff. In the same way, it also anchors my any. And it's why, you know, I know that when my friend went off the bike jump and killed, broke his leg, I can learn from that too. And even though that looks like something maybe new I might want to try, I will probably never do that in my life once somebody else has had that bad experience. So there's a there's a safety mechanism associated with that. And that's that's on a personal level. But I think that that also comes into play in work dynamics, um, community dynamics as well in that um is 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 open minded as as I can be. It's easy for me to sit back and see somebody from a completely different point of view and different background and say, "Hey, that's them," but my SI really anchors me to where did I come from? What is my experience? Um, and what is tried and true? Because um, it, it you know it, it's going to make me less um, moldable if if to use your your word, Joyce, um, than it, say my N if I was an any dom or something, right? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it seems like you do a lot of things in the name of connection or your relationships. And so you're like, yeah, you know, I'll try that new experience or I'll consider this thing for another person or if people are involved. <laughs> people are a big motivational factor to how you decide to do things. That's amazing. You have a big heart. And so how does everyone else experience their F, E and E? I want to piggyback off of what Jonathan was saying um, is it's interesting. I, I was actually just thinking about it this morning is that like, I've gotten really good at like, just like trying things and, and doing it by myself if nobody else will do it with me. But like, it's so much more fun when I can get other people. Now it's not going to go, Oh, I don't want to do something. If you don't have a friend, like I'll just do it. Um, because it's new and that's enough for me. Um, but it's way more fun and way more enjoyable if I can sucker somebody else to come with me. Um, so that, that NE FE, I think it's a similar I'm trying to think of where it is. Yeah, I think it's a, a similar, um, that never mind, just ignore me. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> It's that play. It, it's it feels very fun. It's it's ve a very play um, relationship with the the NEFE. Yeah, it does seem very playful too, and it's gathering people together to kind of have fun together. <laughs> yes, I um, one of my sister in laws is an ESFJ, and I love planning parties with her. I'm like, hey, I've got this idea for this party. You want to plan it with me? And she's like, yes, which means I give her my ideas and she does something with them. That's what planning 
with an ESFJ means like, here's all my ideas. Let's, let's do something structured with that. Um, and it was, it's great. I love it. Yeah. And then the ESFJ hosts the get together to bring the people together. We can see with the ESFJ and the ENTP, they bring people together. So that's a shared quality between them. One of the differences I see between these two types is that ENTPs are sometimes a little bit more experimental with their relationships. So sometimes they'll mess with people to just kind of see their reactions because the NE is the front driver. They're going to wonder about, well, what if I did this? Or what if I did this? Whereas even if the ESFJ has an E, they're very nice guy E. So they're, they're not going to experiment as much with the relationship. So yeah, I think the quality of poking at people to see the reactions is more on the ENTP side. How about FE and NE for Roger and Spacey? How does that seem to show up? Kind of interestingly similar to Amanda as well as what she was saying. Like, I do tend to see the NE as something fun, something uh, interesting and exciting. Um, on my own, it's something that's not very fun. It's something that just causes a lot of issues and problems and a lot of uh, negative thought process processes that just end up occurring. But if I'm around somebody that's high on their NE, it becomes something very fun, experimental, and I get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Uh, whenever I talk to like INFPs, ENFPs, or even uh, one of my best friends is an INTP, um, it gets really fun. It gets really exciting. I'm, I'm always surprised at what ends up happening, either topic of conversation or just what ends up happening if we're, if we're all together. Um, so with other people, with any, it's really fun. It's really interesting. Um, but by myself, it's just <laughs> negative and yeah, definitely have to engage in the FV to kind of get myself out of those, that kind of like negativity of it. Roger, I have a question for you. Um, my, uh, my sister's an ISFJ. I, I adore her. I love ISFJs, but I, um, with, with what you were saying with, somebody else who's using an E, does it help if you know them and you trust them and you kind of have an established connection with them first versus like some rando with like, Hey, we should try this. Like is the, the, I know them, I've already established them as being safe. Is that kind of a prerequisite to having fun? Very interesting. I would say yes. Um, once we have that kind of SI solidification, like, all right, I know who this person is, I kind of have a general idea who they are and what to expect, then it all becomes kind of fun. It's it's really funny because I talk about this with my friends as well, which is a super funny thing where like, um, if we if I'm hanging out with my friends and we go to a restaurant and then I'll think like, ooh, like I'll try something different. But it's like, it's we're always going to the same restaurant. And for me to really say, oh, I'm gonna try something different within the entire scope of, it's the same restaurant that we always go to. How could you be saying? It's not really new because it's within the context of something that you're already familiar with. Versus if I were to go to like a restaurant that I've never been to before, I'm more likely to choose something that I'm familiar with or that I understand as kind of a prerequisite to see, well, is this restaurant maybe a place that I'll come back to again, or is it actually really good? Um, and then kind of explore from there. But yeah, definitely having the foundation first is would be pretty huge to then be able to explore outward afterwards. FE and NE for me, I guess I mostly just kind of use FE to, it smooths out the bumps in the road. So it allows me to blend in with people such that I don't really stick out too much or, or really disturb the waters too much. And I can just kind of observe while being around people. I guess that's kind of the, the overall goal there. Um, at this point in my life, I don't think it's always been that way, but I do just like spending time around people or, you know, talking to them, obviously, if they'll talk about something that I'm interested in talking about. Um, I guess, if I can avoid all those negative aspects of any that Roger brought up and the positive aspects are driving me, then it ends up kind of being that in order for me to satisfy my curiosity, I have to go hang out with people more or less. So I guess that's sort of the connection there. Yeah. So it seems like you enjoy NE and FE when it comes in your to your life. But sometimes there's a little bit of a permission that needs to be there for you to fully sink into those functions. And so it seems like with Roger, 
he gives himself permission to do the NE when he has a solid SI foundation. And it seems like the extroverts of this group are more initiating and they will proactively bring people together or try to instigate people being together. Whereas the introverts in this group tend to be more responding in the sense that they'll, they'll wait for the FE or the NE to come to them. I am kind of curious, uh, Spacey. I mean, Roger kind of talked about how his um, his NE's given permission by his SI. So his SI set the set the, the rules. He's got a relationship with somebody. Once he knows that they're somebody that he can trust, now now we can have some NE fun, right? Things can open up and that sort of thing. But obviously, you don't lead with SI, right? And leading with TI, that's going to be more about what makes sense to you personally, right? I mean, does this make logical sense to do these things add up? And it doesn't even necessarily need to be about people for you in that case. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, what, 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 how does TI give your any permission to come out and to try new things? Um, what's the relationship between that logic function and the information that you gather and put it together and being able to try new things or think, think new ways? Um. It's just, well, I do I think I'm gonna learn something from it, I guess. Um, do, I, do I think it's actually gonna make some kind of positive difference? I guess, uh, I guess it's kind of utilitarian. It's like, is it worth the energy I'm gonna put into it and the, the relative risk involved? Uh, yeah, how much juice am I gonna get out of the experience? Cool. That makes sense. I, I like how you put that. Can I? The first thing that popped out was, can I learn something from that? And I was kind of wondering that in the back of my mind, if it had to do with where can I find more, right, information? And then, of course, you put value on what that is. So cool. Thank you. Does your does the TI kind of have to give permission for the FE to come into play too? Um, kind of like what Roger and Jonathan were saying, like. So the, the FE is your, the inferior and the opposite of the TI. So d in order to feel s safe, I guess, and, and to have permission to use the FE more, does it have to like follow certain rules or, or meet certain criteria from the TI? Like, uh, does that question make sense? I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, what I'll say, I guess, is that um, I I would say that T all my TI is doing socially. I I would say in the context that you're talking about is uh, it's basically putting together rule sets for interacting with people that are like. Uh, universalized. So if I respond to what this person said in in this way. Um, nothing bad's going to happen. They're going to get the, the idea. They're not going to be offended, yada, 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 yada. And everything's going to keep going smoothly. Um, if anything, even if you're leading with TI, I would say that your TI is actually going to be restricted by whatever FE rule sets you have, however rudimentary or unimportant or whatever they might be. So basically over time, I've learned to get, you know, a filter, you know, from my FE, right? And if anything that's in that filter, right, doesn't get through because, you know, people don't want to hear that shit. Yeah, it's almost like you have the FE and then you put it into a TI principle. It's like, oh, okay, now I, I know these social rules, so I'm going to factor it into my TI principles or TI algorithm of how I approach these situations. So it's almost like it, the, the FE did a osmosis or absorbing into your TI framework like, oh, yeah, I'm going to add that to my framework for how to interact. I think our conversation right now is demonstrating how our lower down functions are filtered through our dominant function. So your lower functions will be flavored by the dominant. For instance, with Amanda's function stack, she has any TI, FE, SI. But the TI, FE, SI flavoring has a little bit of NE influence of the dominant function interacting with the other functions in a cool way. How about SI and TI? How do you guys experience those functions? 
I guess I can go. Those are kind of like my <laughs> top three there. Uh, it's it can be very very introverting. Um, <laughs> typically, when when I'm more focused on those kind of uh, functions, I'm just thinking more about more about the past, more analyzing about maybe what I could have done differently, what could have what what are some things that could have been done better, more efficiently, um, what I could be doing for the future, um, what I could be doing better, but it's generally a time where I'll just <laughs> be more on my own, be more by myself, not wanting to uh, interact or talk with other people. So it can be a very introverted kind of spiral on my end. Um, and yeah, for me, I think engaging in those functions is more related to looking towards the past, what has happened, what I've done, um, am, am I in a good position currently? What are some things that I could do to change? Just kind of trying to analyze whatever thing about the past that can benefit for my present or future. I, I actually relate quite a bit to what Roger's describing. Uh, the TI and SI tend to be the, um, they're the regulators in my life, right? Because I live so extrovertedly um, and and it, and then because it's fe right, it's like ex it, it's extra extroverted, I guess, because people dr are what are drawing me out, and people are out here, people aren't in here, and so um, there's this this regulation process that that goes on, um, which is why it's actually important for me to stop fe sometime, uh, you know, use basically use my si to manage my time to take time for myself and to introspect on things. And um, so I find that my, uh, you know, that's what it is. Do I analyze what I've done? That's what my SI does. It helps me analyze what I've done, what my culture has done, what the people around me have done, and what's the conclusion from that? How do I learn? What does that imply, right? Because I, I'm not an intuitive, right? So in, in my particular case, there needs to be some concrete steps between all the things before I come to the conclusion. But you have to get into your SI, or in my case, Sometimes my TI, which is much more of a stretch, where I'm start, I'm, I start applying my own logic, which scares the crud out of me because I'm not smart enough to do that, right? That's what SI is great because I can rely, I can basically crowdsource what's right and what's wrong and what I'm supposed to learn. And that's what SI does. It's awesome that way, right? I mean, think about the offload there. Now I can just spend all my energy on people, which is what I'd rather do. But the truth is, right, that uh, there's, there's, you know, further down the line that TI is where's, where's my logic. And I think sometimes people um, might misinterpret that TI as being just logic, um, but, or collecting data, but the big piece of it is t because it's an introverted function, it's what is my personal logic, right? I take the data points that I've found and I put them together in a logical way. And that's what my TI helps me do. Um, and I actually, I use that all the time, actually. I mean, I, I work in technology. Um, I've been, you know, a solutions architect for IT solutions for years and years. And um, and you, you normally wouldn't see an ESFJ in a job like that. But the truth is that TI comes into play all the time as I'm designing, you know, solutions based upon the logic of the components and stuff that I put together. And in a good place, it, that can be very, very exhilarating and very fun. But my experience is I'm a little slower at it than probably Spacey is. Um, uh, you know, he, he doesn't he doesn't have to put a lot of effort probably into thinking in a logical way. Can I just say that Solutions Architect is an amazing name? Well, I wish I could take credit and say I made that up, but I did. So, so I I love the way that Roger and and Jonathan I love the way that y'all talk about SI because I have such a such a weird love hate relationship with SI. Like most of the time, it's like an annoying sibling. Like I just, I just want it to go away. Um, but like other parts of it, I'm like, no, I, I do love like, um, you know, I, I, I do love some traditions. I can get kind of like not the ish on my own traditions because I have to double down on it. Um, Otherwise I lose it. And, uh, um, and there's parts of it. Like, I feel like strong SI users, they just feel safe. And I like that a lot. And I, I feel like sometimes I do not feel like 
oh, I'm going to hang out with Amanda. She feels safe. Like that's not, that's not the vibe that I give off. Um, and I really, I really like that. But other times I'm like, ugh, as I was trying to ruin my vibe, like I'm just having fun. Why do we have to do things the way that we've always done them? Why do we have to have a, a, a institution for something like meh? Like it's, you know, but I, I love to hear the perspective of, of people who are like, no, it's, it's really great. Um, so it's really, it's really interesting to me because um, my relationship with it is, is sometimes strained. Uh, but um, TI, like it's like what you said, Jonathan, it, it slows me down. It has to, right? It, it's what um, pulls me in. And uh, sometimes if I'm, I'm really in E, like, duh, and then all of a sudden, because it's just information, information, and it's all like, fairly unrelated information, but somehow I pull it all together. And then I realize, oh, shoot, there's a stack of information that I need to do something with now. And so then I have to go in TI, like, okay, filter, like what it makes sense, what makes personal sense to me and, and kind of inventory it. Um, so it is a more introverting process and helps, helps, balance my my energy yeah that love hate relationship with our last function is real and so spacey what is your experience with the functions ti and si i mean they uh i guess like jonathan put it they are kind of like the the more regimented functions uh i mean they tend to be very particularist to the point where you know, everything inside your your head got it kind of gets really, really sterile and you find yourself being really particular about like a certain choice of words or the way to, just that something is like where you like an object to be in your house or whatever the case it is. If something's wrong, there's like this need to correct it and align it with whatever your perception of the truth currently is. So that's like what TI and SI are constantly doing. Uh, in my mind, um, I find SI really good for like explaining concepts to people by attaching them to things that they may already be familiar with. So, you know, figure out what someone else's experience is, see if you can match it up with yours anywhere, and then, you know, come up with a good example of something that they'll understand. Yeah, that's what I have for now. That is a really good point, Spacey. Yeah, so SI is very good at rooting things back to a concrete hook or a concrete explanation or a concrete example. It's known for examples in a concrete way. And so the next topic is fun. What do you guys do for fun? What do you do in your free time? What is what is fun for you? Theoretically or like actual things? Both. <laughs> Okay. Like, what do you do in your free time fun? But you can also do the, if you had unlimited money fun too, it doesn't really matter. I smoke weed and play video games. I'll jump on that and say video games as well. Um, but I also used to be a part of uh, meetup groups where I would talk with other people as well about uh, MBTI and uh, Enneagram. So uh, meeting new people, talking with people is also pretty cool. Um, but of course, I don't have that much of a capacity for it. So it's usually like a once a month kind of a thing. And then after that, I just go back to my hole and stay there kind of a thing. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be a little bit of an outlier. My um, being an FE driver means whatever the people around me want to do for fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit sad, but don't, nobody should feel bad for the ESFJs because we, we actually enjoy that, right? It's, it's how I got into you know, personality typology, right? Is somebody around me was interested in it was fun for them. And then I was able to engage with them and connect with them and do that. But I mean, aside from that stuff, when it's just me and I get in my box, my, uh, uh, my NETI play really love sci-fi movies and books and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, really it's, what other people are doing for fun is generally what I want to do as long as my SI says it's safe. 
Um, I really like uh, sci-fi or fantasy books, audiobooks. I do a lot of that for fun. Um, any anything with a weird like concept that I can just like whirl around my brain for a while. I I love it. And I usually have like two or three books that I'm reading or books slash concepts that I'm like playing with at the same time. Um, more is more with my brain. Um, so uh, it's just, that's my play is like, oh, I can think about this and this and this and this, and I might mix them all together. Um, that's my, that's my fun. Um, various side projects. I've got a lot of them going and I feel my, I was just talking to my husband about this. He's like, why do you have so many side projects? And I'm like, cause I feel more like myself when I have more than one, like I, I want multiple side projects and I just feel more like myself if I have more of them and, and his brain's going like, Oh, like, it's okay, babe. It's okay. <laughs> are these side projects private or are you willing to share what these are? Oh yeah. I don't, I don't care. Um, uh, one of them, a friend and I are, um, working on a podcast. Um, another friend and I are working on a, um, a business with a, uh, we're doing like a subscription box business. Um, I'm also planning my, well, I should be done planning by now. I am mostly done planning, um, my garden and, um, and then I'm also working on, um, just teaching myself a new, a new, uh, uh, type of, um, meditation, and so I'm going through, but so those are, those are my current projects. Cool. Sounds awesome. With an NE driver, anything is possible. <laughs> and so what are things that you find a little bit more energy draining? What takes a little bit more effort to do? What is not your favorite thing to do? Okay, I'll go first. So right now in my life currently. It's not always this way, but I, I find myself in a position where I'm, I'm managing a lot of people's emotions and I, I get exhausted. It's just a lot of work. Um, now if it was other problems, fine. I love it. Um, but the, the managing, the managing other people's emotions, um, makes me tired sometimes want to throw something it's it's an interesting question because i i don't generally don't think about what i don't like to do because when you when you lead fesi it's not about what i like or don't like in my life right i mean because it's what do other people need and what does the tribe say that i'm supposed to do and both of those things are driven by an external force to myself so I, I'd say what I hate doing the most, what gets me the most frustrated is when there's something I'm supposed to do, right? An, an obligation that I have from usually from my SI and I don't have the time to do it or somebody else has a need and they're in pain or they're hurting or they're inconvenienced and I wanna help them and I don't have the time or the energy or the know-how to do it. And so that could be anything. It's not like an actual thing. The worst experiences in the world for, I think, an ESFJ in general is not being able to take care of everybody that's in, in my sphere of influence. And that could be the refrigerator in my garage, which isn't cooling the way it's supposed to. And my wife is telling me that the pasta is going to go bad. And I'm like, well, I've got to you know, I got to get off work and then I'm taking the kid to Taekwondo and then I'm getting on with Joyce tonight for a thing. And I don't know if I'm going to have time to research how to fix a refrigerator. And meanwhile, my wife is stressed out because um, INTJs sometimes get stressed out about things like broken refrigerators. 
And um, we're all not. Yeah. I mean, that's the, and meanwhile, I'm in knots and every spare moment I get, I'm thinking about how am I going to fix the refrigerator so that my wife isn't upset? And um, so it is, it's really not about the refrigerator because I love solving problems when I'm in a play mode and I like working with my hands. SI makes interacting with the world generally and experiencing things fun because there's a lot I can learn from that. Even if it's maybe something gross, like plunging a toilet, I don't care. Cleaning up my kid's barf, I don't care. But it, what, what's hard though, right, is when I'm not meeting people's needs. So it could be any one of those things. It could be anything in the world that I don't enjoy doing if somebody else is upset about it and I'm not taking care of it fast enough or um, yeah, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. So letting people down is your biggest nightmare because it, it's like you're not able to relax until you're able to take care of people's needs and get them back to the emotional equilibrium. Yeah. And I mean, to be truthful, TI helps, right? Cause there's a certain amount of logic. And as I've gotten older, I can use the logic that I have to say, you can't make everybody happy. But I would say the SI weighs in there too, because SI implies obligation. And that, that obligation also weighs very heavily. I would imagine Roger sometimes feels that, um, you know, that pressure, right, from the tribe, that there's certain things that he should do and shouldn't do. Um, and uh, when you're not living up to that obligation, that's, that it's really uncomfortable. It's super interesting because I've been trying to think about what you said, but like, thankfully, I guess for me, like, I don't feel um, like it's a humongous thing if I am not able to meet other people's expectations. Um, I maybe I don't know if it's more of a personal thing or not, but I've been in a lot of situations where I've tried to do all that I possibly can for friends, for other people, and even people that were ungrateful. And I just learned after that, that, I mean, all I can do really is do the best that I can. And if that's just not enough, then I should still walk away from that experience satisfied knowing that I've done what I could. And regardless of what other people take from that, that's on them. And whatever I was able to do is on me. And that's ultimately what matters. So yeah, thankfully for me, it's not so much of a huge thing. So yeah, that, that's just such an interesting difference. Um, but in terms of the, the uh, question, um, I've been trying to think too. My first original thought was um, being in an environment where it's just a lot of negative chaos, I think would just be the absolute worst thing for me. If I'm surrounded by like strangers or if, like there's a fight going on or an argument going on and I don't know anybody there, that is just absolutely terrible. And I can't feel like I can't like run away or <laughs> go somewhere else. That just feels like an absolute uh, nightmare for me. And being unable to resolve it, being unable to help. Um, I, I think maybe for me, it's just not being useful or not providing some kind of utility. It would be my biggest uh, concern or worry or nightmare, I guess, that I wouldn't like. Like that, that I've been so motivated in my past to learn about different things, to be a better person so that I can better know how to help others. Um, so I feel like I've just been mostly motivated through that kind of a thing for me personally, at least. Yeah, throwing you into a completely unfamiliar situation where you can't relate any of your past experiences back to it to solve it in any way. <laughs> it's like, oh no, that is quite the chaos indeed. And Spacey? I mean, I guess I really don't like tedious things that just take a lot of time and attention and they're extremely boring. Um, you know, could be paperwork, could just be a dead end job. I mean, could be anything like that. Um, I also really relate to Roger when it comes to like, if I'm like stuck in a, in the middle of a conflict with somebody and I can't resolve it and I can't get away from it, that's pretty horrifying. Um, what else? Um, you know, I, I also hate feeling useless. Like it's really important to me to like uh, be able to be competent at things that I set my mind to and be self-sufficient. Like I really actually hate having to ask people for help. Like I will wander around a grocery store for two hours before I ask somebody who works there to like show me where something is. Roger is nodding emphatically. Do you relate to that? The like, I can't ask for help. 
Uh, it's such a terrible, terrible trade. Um, it's, it's up to, I, I'm the exact same way. Like if I'm really pressed and I need help, then I will, but I will try as much as I can to try to figure out the issue on my own. Um, but, and it's so funny cause this is something that I talk about with, uh, my girlfriend who's an ESFJ and even with my friends who are extroverted, like if I'm like a Spacey said, if I'm at a store and I can't find something, it's like, all right, you get to ask. I don't want to ask. I don't want to talk to other people. You can go ahead and do that. You'll get a good kick out of it. You have a wonderful conversation with them and talk <laughs> about your dogs and your cats and whatever. And I'll just be out there in the little corner and uh, trying to figure out where something else is or whatever. So, but yeah, I, I, I guess I don't know what that is for me. Maybe it's just, I don't want to inconvenience other people with my issues. That that that's like the first thing that comes to mind in terms of not wanting to uh, ask or inconvenience others for something that I'm struggling with or going through. Well, there's that chaos element too that you were talking about, Roger. If you're going to go to a stranger, this is not somebody you've talked to before. They're 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 an unknown element, right? And even though it's it's not that you don't care about them as a person, and you do care about inconveniencing them or not which, right, I mean, you're, and, and you realize there's social rules around that, right? You don't, it's not nice to put people out, right? And, but I mean, I, I think that there's this, this whole piece of, there's an unknown element. As soon as you engage with them, they could do anything, right? And so it, I kind of get the feeling that that's an any low down sort of a deal where it's like, if you are, if, if you're, if you're really comfortable with different types of things flying at you, that's fine. But I mean, for all, they could yell at you. They could give you the right answer. They could give you the wrong answer. They might break down crying and say, my husband left me today. I mean, they, it can, anything could happen when you talk to somebody. People are crazy, right? So yeah, that it totally makes sense. But when Spacey was talking, I was kind of chuckling to myself because I'm like, why wouldn't you just go talk to the people? You're missing an opportunity to talk to a person. <laughs> but I realized that it's a little bit insane, right? Because not everybody feels that way. And in certain circumstances, I don't feel that way either. But generally speaking, you know, people are people, right? I mean, that's, I, people aren't scary to me that that's not an unknown thing. I feel like I can handle that. But part of that might be age too, right? I've, I, you know, I, I've got quite a few decades behind me now. And so there's, there's my SI has taught me that I don't need to be scared of people, especially people I don't know, because I've met a lot of different people in my life. Um, and I'm coming, coming up on 50 pretty soon. So I've been doing this, been been living around for a while and I've met a lot of people. Okay, Roger, d do you agree with that? Like, this is so fascinating to me. Um, I, Joyce, we might have to camp out here for a little bit. Um, is that is that part of it? They, is that a chaos element? Would you consider like, I don't know this person, I don't know what they're gonna say. Is that chaos to you? Uh, I think in a small way it is. What helps and what I was going to make a comment on is that my SI will help like if I'm going to like, let's say like a Walmart that I'm always go to, that's already at least comfortable enough for me to at least be comfortable like to talk to somebody else. Like, well, I've been to this store a few times. I guess it's OK enough for me to try something new now that I've already known. But if I'm like at a completely new store, a new place, never been to, then I'm probably most likely not going to ask or say anything because there is that bit of chaos unless I'm just really hard pressed or there's other concerns I'm pressed for time or I don't know there's something else that's happening where that I'm forced to then I just suck it up and do it but given the choice I wouldn't it's fascinating even though like if you're in a brand new place it's makes sense that you don't know where the things are so then you're more likely to need help uh, I, again, rely on the SI. It's like, well, in typical stores, there's a section for the food. There's a section for the, like, utilities and kitchen stuff and whatever. So I will always rely back on the SI. It's like, okay, well, what do I remember about stores? Like, where do they keep their things? And if I if my SI fails me, that's where then the FE has to come next. And then that, with FE, I have to talk to someone. I have to ask. So it's, yeah, just going down the line of the functions there. That's so fun. That's so interesting. It makes me think because like, I don't, I don't have problems with, well, I don't have any reservations with asking people any, like, where is this? What are you doing? What is that in your basket? Like I, but, and I don't like, now that we're talking, I think there's also 
my Annie's also kind of looking like, I don't know what they're going to say. They might say something really weird and it might be a really funny story afterwards. Like, like they could tell me something super random. They could give me information. I don't know. They could like, and that's exciting to me, even if it's possibly negative, because that's still a story afterwards that I could spin in a really funny direction. Um, so it's like, but I never thought of it as, well, I don't, can't say I ever really thought of it, but I wouldn't have associated it with NE without you having said that in, in a more like any negative way. That's so interesting. I would say if it's a place I have to go shopping at all the time, then I would definitely not want to talk to anybody because I don't want to be recognized. So I'm actually like the total opposite there. Um, you know, if it's a place I'm never coming back to, then I'll take, you know, I'll take way more risks when it comes to like approaching people or, you know, potentially looking like an insane, crazy person. What's the problem of, with being recognized? Well, there's nothing wrong with being recognized, but it's more like being recognized as like that weird guy, you know, quote unquote. Um, Why would people be judging you for asking the question? Well, I don't know. They might, they might not be. Chances are they probably don't care. Um, but there's still like a certain level of paranoia there. Um, maybe that's just because when I was a kid, I kind of had that experience of like uh, saying things that either hurt people's feelings were somehow offensive or were just like so out there where it's like, what the hell are you even talking about? Um, you know, combined with my inability to like smooth things over socially just kind of led me to this point where, you know, you're a lot more hesitant to interact with people because uh, the last few times didn't go very well. So I guess at the end of it all boils down into your SI. Do, so, I mean, you talk about like, if it's a store you go to all the time, you'd rather not engage with the people there. Right. Do, do you feel like if you did, then now there's a social pressure that the next time you go in, you have to acknowledge that person again because now you've made a connection and you, you are you trying to avoid that? That's part of it, yeah, actually. It's pretty uh, pretty perceptive of you, but yeah, I would say that's definitely a big part of it. It's gonna take away your energy. It also depends because, um, for example, if I go to like the vape store, um, I'm, I'm fine with that because it's like, I have to interact with those people. Like it's, it's part, it's like baked into the, the vape shop relationship experience. Whereas if I'm in like a Walmart or something, it's, it's way less of a thing to form relationships with the people who work there. You know, it's like, uh, it's like, you're not going to your friendly neighborhood auto mechanic or vape shop purveyor or whatever, like, the, the, the particular people there, like, it doesn't really matter. Um, you're just going there for your groceries and you're leaving. So it's, it sounds like in certain situations, your TI just takes over, right? There's, there's a certain logical experience that you would expect and that you manage based upon that's what that situation is. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that totally makes sense. So what is everyone's confidence with being able to smooth things over? Let's say that you accidentally do say something potentially offensive or it was taken the wrong way by the other person. What do you do then? For me, it kind of depends on the context. Um, I get more nervous with um, like a heavy female population saying something offensive. Um, because I feel like there's more rules and, um, and there's, there's more rules to accidentally break. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, I can smooth most things over. Um, and I, I have little tips even with, even with, uh, like, <laughs> like if I do something, um, with, with girl, like in a girl group, and uh, you, I'm I'm in Texas, so I can go. Oh, bless my heart! I so didn't mean that. What was I thinking, silly me? And then just like move it along. Um, and um, I feel like with with a more of a mixed group, I can be very charming. Um, and um, like with with guys, I can um, actually be insulting, and then it comes across as funny, and then we just it just moves right along. Um, 
So it's actually easier for me to manage in a mixed or more guy group because you can be a little stereotypical, right? You can be a little rougher with your humor. Um, but uh, with girls, I have to go more self-depreciating. Um, like, oh, sorry, silly me. If you apologize a lot, it's usually okay. That's a good strategy. Now I'm curious about how often do all of these types offend people? How often do you offend people? Because you don't have to speak on behalf of your type. You can just speak on behalf of you. When I was younger, it was a lot. <laughs> now it's not so much. Uh, but also, also when I was younger, it was kind of funny to, to offend people. Like I, I found it slightly entertaining, not slightly. I found it very entertaining. Um, now that I'm older and there's more repercussions to offending people, uh, not very, I, I would say not very often that I'm aware of. Well, I'm offended that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think actually the, the question about how often do you offend? So I think there is a stereotype among ESFJs that they're, they're very nice and pretty inoffensive, except they can be kind of strong and bossy in certain social situations that I've seen the nods, right? That, that extroverted piece comes out and then the SI kicks in. This is the way that it's supposed to be. And if everybody's going to be happy, there's that piece. I'd say when I was younger, it didn't occur to me that I was offending anybody because I was doing what was best for everybody. And, and, and so there's, there's an optimism and an obliviousness that I've grown up with. My life experience though has taught me and I would say typology has helped me a ton with this, is that there are there is just such a plethora of different ways of experiencing the world that the things that I see as being benign and soft and caring can actually be very offensive to some people, especially if they're in a bad place and they're looking for offense. And we all kind of land there sometimes, right? Having a bad day and pretty much anybody, we want to punch them in the face, right? And um, so I don't, I, you know, I try to avoid it at all costs, but I can say that just from my experience looking back, thank you, SI, um, smoothing it over, it's, it's not generally a, a difficult thing for me to do. That as soon as I recognize I've done something wrong, um, it, honestly, even if it's not my fault, my, I just, I, I tell my TI to take a hike basically and say, doesn't matter what the logic is their perception is their reality and my relationship with them is more important than any fact or any obligation. Therefore, I'm so happy to fall on a sword and say it was my fault. What can I do to make it different? And, and I found that most people, they're pretty cool with me taking the blame for something. So, uh, and, and the thing is though, is it's not fake. Some people might say, oh, you're just manipulating the situation. And I'm just saying, as an ESFJ, it's really not, what I do may manipulate the situation in that I'm trying to make it better, but I'm not doing it cognitively, right, to make something un, unreal, right, or fake. Um, but it's just literally, I would much rather take the responsibility for myself that something went wrong or I said something or did something. And um, and I found find everybody can move on from that a lot better because I, I got no problem forgiving myself because I give myself space to be imperfect too because my N-E-F-E -E gives everybody else space to be imperfect as well. Um, again, part of that is where I'm at in life. Not always been that way in the past, but definitely something I've learned. Amanda, you reacted very strongly when Jonathan was talking about, even if it's not true, I'll tell my TI to take a hike. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I get how that is a quick fix. I mean, not like, not like a superficial fix, but like a, I'll fall on the sword. Oh, uh, part of my heart dies a little. Uh, <laughs> like, don't do that. No, you need to explain to them why they're wrong. <laughs> that doesn't help either. Uh, I, that what Jonathan, when you were telling a story that, or when you were talking, that reminded me of a story of my, uh, my sister-in-law who's an ESFJ who like you meet her and you're like, no one on earth can be mad at, at, at her. Like it's so hard to be mad at. 
uh, at her. She's just, you know, doing her ESFJ thing, ma- meeting everybody's needs. Like she's lovable and, and, um, but she thought I was, um, mad at her. So she was going, she was extra, extra charming, extra, like she just really wanted me to know how much she loved me or, or how much she liked me. And she, she was just going like over and my res- I didn't know that's what she was doing. And my response was, what is going on? Why is she trying so hard? She must not like me. It's, it was such a, like, when we finally figured it out, what was going on, we're like, that is such a strange interaction because it was like the ESFJ, like, no, I really want them to know that I like them. And I'm like, this feels fake. What's going on? It was, it was a, it was just an interesting dynamic to me. Sorry. Sometimes we just don't even get it. It's true. We, we kind of figure well, we all do that, right? We think other people look at the world the same way we do. And, but yeah, fortunately, people like you have taught me how superficial sometimes things can come off. And so I, and this is where the TI comes in, right? Because that takes logic. I have to think about that in a cognitive, I mean, that this is about, this is about what makes sense as opposed to how I feel and how somebody else feels. And um, yeah, so Sorry, I'm apologizing for ESFJs that seem fake sometimes. Oh, there's another sword you can fall on. (laughs) Yeah. Did I? I just did that, didn't I? I totally just did that. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, A readiness to fall on the sword. (laughs) Sometimes I wonder if having TI lower down makes it harder for you to justify things too. So it's like, I don't know how to explain to you how like your introverted thinking is still good enough to know that it wasn't your fault and you know that but it's it's sometimes harder to explain exactly why it isn't your fault so instead of going through the entire trouble of trying to explain to them the logic because sometimes it's difficult to it's like i'd rather just fall on the sword because i don't know if i could communicate this in a way where it makes sense and it might cause you grief it it might seem like i'm defending myself in a way where i'm not caring for your feelings too so that's why like I find like in heavy debates, TI last types like ESFJs or even ENFJs, they might feel insecure with debating things. So it's like, oh, I don't know if my debate skills are that good. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why they don't like combat you back for why I didn't do this, why it doesn't make sense. Because it's like, can I, will I be able to defend myself in a debate about this? <laughs> sufficiently enough. I think, I think that's really true, Joyce. I'm curious if Roger feels that way. I mean, cause he's not, it's not fourth, it's third. So it's a little more accessible to him, but anyway, I'm kind of curious if he feels that way about the debating or arguing his point. It was so interesting. Cause I was following your logic up until that point when he said, I'll gladly fall on the stars. Like, ah, no, no. I was like with Amanda, like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, the, I, like if there's a mistake or something that I've made, like I have no issue addressing it, going over it, like talking about it and trying to get it resolved as much as possible. Um, if they're in a position where they're not willing to talk about it, don't want to talk about it, then that's outside of my hands. There's nothing else I can do about it. And I just walk away and wait until they approach me about it at a later time and whatnot. But the biggest issue for me is that whatever the conflict or issue was, I am going to overthink about it. <laughs> so like if I for like if I accidentally insulted somebody, I will go ahead and resolve it with them, talk it over, you know, apologize, whatnot. But I'm going to go back home feeling terrible, feeling like, what have I done? What am I doing <laughs> with myself? Like, what? how could that have happened to me? Like, I'll just completely start overthinking about it and just kind of blaming myself for it. Um, there, I feel like there's a balance when, and, and I think like what Amanda says, like, it just kind of depends on the context. If if it's something that I know is not necessarily my fault or there's something of myself that I can explain, I will do so, but those are only to people that I'm comfortable with. If it's somebody that is like a stranger and, or I don't really know that well, then sure, I I don't really care that much. Then it's like, okay, whatever makes you feel happy, I'm cool. And I can just walk away from it, no big deal. 
if it's somebody that I care about, I will take more steps to ensure that everything is okay between the two of us or others. Um, but I will feel terrible afterwards and overthink about that entire issue. Even after, like after you like, oh, sorry, like, like moving on. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, it'll, it'll stick, it'll stick and I'll keep replaying the event or like, it'll, it'll keep replaying whether I like to or not, it will keep replaying like what I said, their reaction, what they do. And then I'll start overthinking like what they're capable of. This is something that can happen in the future again. And it'll just go into a whole like spiral of just thinking like, well, this is something that, this is something potentially new that I learned about this person. This is something that can happen. It's within, uh, expectations now I guess in the future that this can happen will happen and I just have to be very careful with what I say from here on out and then I'll just feel terrible about it afterwards but I'm not going to mention it to them oh no <laughs> I'm super curious how long do you all dwell if you've hurt someone's feelings like what Roger was talking about after I've talked to that person and I feel like there's like a closure or or so I when I was younger, I, I used to think that everything had to have like a direct conversation. I, I'm a fairly direct person. So I'd want to be like, Hey, are you mad? Oh, you're mad. Okay. Why are you mad? All right, let's fix this. Okay. And now I'm like, I don't have to do that. Cause I know some people just like, that doesn't help at all. Um, but so once it's, there's been a connection reestablished, I'm done. It's done. Like, Moving on. I mean, I'll feel bad about something basically forever. Um, I mean, will I dwell on it all that much, you know, after it's been a, you know, a few weeks, a few months or whatever? Not really, but it's something that will always like come back into my mind and I'll like wince at it and be like, God, why did you do that? Um, but, uh, you know, I guess I used to offend people, not because I liked offending people, but just because, like, if I thought someone was stupid, I'd tell them they were stupid. And that was, you know, it was, like, really simple. Uh, but obviously, that's mean. So, um, you know, I learned not to do that. I guess these days, I really don't offend anybody because I, at least in most public situations, I'm really careful before I speak now. And uh, I mostly try to, like, ask people questions rather than make statements. And uh, I don't know, I generally try to avoid conflict so much that uh, my strategies to avoid creating conflicts have gotten pretty good. How many people in this room are guilty of calling someone stupid? I think the better question is, what is it that makes us call them stupid? Because I think that's probably very different things amongst the people that are here. Yeah. Yeah. In my case, I was like five years old and they were just stupid because they didn't know something that I knew, you know, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And, and for me, people are stupid when they don't treat other people nicely or they don't follow the social rules to take care of other people. That makes them stupid. You cut somebody off in traffic. That's stupid. But not knowing something. I don't I don't care. That reminds me, I, I love the the question, like when you're profiling somebody else to try to to get like oh, more insight into their cognitive functions is what what do you what do you understand that you're just surprised that people don't get? Um, because it's like like what you said, Jonathan, like, you know, it just depends. Like it it could be doesn't everybody know that you just have to be nice to others or doesn't everyone know that you just should make sense? Like, come on. <laughs> like, yeah, it, it's so telling of what, what cognitive functions you use is like, I mean, you're stupid if you don't get this. Why do you call people stupid? Me? Um, Oh gosh, I, f I feel bad saying, answering this question. Uh, let me count the ways. No, um, it's, if, if people are seen to be very, like more emotionally or reactional, if they're real reactional and just dive into something that doesn't like, it's not one and one is not making, you know, if it just doesn't make sense, I don't, 
I keep saying that and I feel like I need to break it down a little bit better, but if it's more reactional and it's, it's not logical, I'm like, why, why did you miss this? Like, why, why is this hard for you? I don't understand why, why you can't, why this doesn't make sense to you. That that's, that's where it gets me. And <laughs> And even when I was little, yeah, like Spacey said, definitely as an elementary school, I think I told, I think I told like a, a teacher or something, you're not very smart, are you? <laughs> it's so bad. And I didn't mean it bad. I was just like, wow. Hmm. It's like, it's not offensive. It's just information. I'm trying to think of when I've called people stupid. It's not very often, but I think for me, it's been, I've generally just had a lot of issues with extroverted thinkers. So like ESTJs of like, do this way or the hard way and not taking people's emotions, thoughts or feelings into consideration. I think that's what irks me a lot. It's like, if you have an issue or if someone has an issue and it's like, well, here you go, just do this and you're going to be, happier it's like well you, you first didn't even ask how they're feeling what the how they're doing what what is that like you haven't even explored anything about the surrounding context or details about this person but you're already telling them what they should be doing um that to me just irks me a lot and unfortunately i think that just kind of <laughs> tends to go down the uh n-i-t-e route but that's just how it is yeah, so it seems like for the ISFJ and the ESFJ, they call people stupid when they're stupid at FEing. It's like, you suck at FEing. You're stupid at FEing. <laughs> I can't believe it. Whereas, yeah. like, the ENTP and the INTP, they call people stupid informationally, like their knowledge is stupid or they're not making sense. Things aren't lining up or they're doing something that is irrational. It's either it's irrational and it's amusing because it's so dumb or it's irrational and it's annoying me that this is dumb. <laughs> this does not make sense. <laughs> cool. All right. That's fascinating. Hmm. How often do you introduce novelty into your life? How do you receive your novelty in your life? In a month or whatever timeline you'd like to use, how much novelty do you get? How much do you deviate from how you typically do things? And where is the deviation? I think the majority of the novelty that comes into my life is vicarious by simply talking to other people and learning about what they do that's different and then just enjoying their experience, right? Through through the share, because doing something different for me can be really disruptive. Um, and then also in short doses of, like I mentioned before, sci-fi films and books, um, some, you know, different, you know, create a different universe and, and experience that particular sort of a thing. But, um, and, and this might be part of my place in life. I mean, I've got four kids at home and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working full time and I've, I've got all kinds of other things. So I don't have a lot of room to do something outside of, you know, what, what my obligations are right now. Um, but of course I say that, right? Because I'm putting that expectation on myself. There are probably people in the same place in life with me, which introduce a lot of novelty now that I say that. Um, but for me, I don't feel safe doing that. So it tends to be in little spurts of entertainment. And then as a way, the novelty comes in as a way to connect with other people and learn about other people. Uh, I really don't get that much novelty in my life, mostly because I don't really, you know, have the drive to seek it out. Um, you know, every now and then something, you know, happens in my life that provides an opportunity for novelty. And I try not to miss those opportunities these days. And I try to drag them out for as long as possible. So usually a lot of crazy stuff will happen in one big, relatively short burst. And then I'll kind of wind up in the same routine again for a long time. Uh, I would say I'm usually reliant on other people in my life to provide these opportunities and drag me along to something. Uh, so right now that would be my girlfriend mainly, you know, she's, uh, you know, encourages me to like, you know, look for a new job or a new apartment or, you know, do something different than we normally do. Cause, uh, I'm not really good at coming up with things that I think will like satisfy whatever it is that I want from new experiences. I guess I kind of have this, 
unrealistic desire for everything to be like some kind of mind blowing acid trip kind of experience? Uh, for me, it's, I guess it's not too often that I tend to do something outside of the norm. Um, like I mentioned before, I think most of the things that I tend to be, that I tend to do more often is uh, doing something different within the context or frame of something that's already familiar to me. So like something for me that I like to do sometimes is like when it comes to like uh, where I live, like I like to switch things around maybe sometimes like I'll switch where like the position goes for like drawers and beds or stuff like that. Um, or sometimes within the city, I'll go to like a random new like restaurant just to try it out and see, but it's all within context of things that I'm familiar with versus completely going outside to like a place I've never been to before. It's not very common, but that's something that I rely on my extroverted friends to kind of help me push, my, push myself out of my shell a bit. And so through my extroverted friends, I'm able to kind of push myself out there a little bit more and explore different things and uh, be able to do those things. Um, it's not very often though. I don't know if I would necessarily even put like a time frame on it. If I did, maybe like what, like once every two months or every few months or so, maybe just trying to do something different, something new. Um, but yeah, it's not very often. I'm pretty, <laughs> pretty okay with uh, doing things repetitively. It's not that much of an issue for me. Uh, not enough. Um, I, I have a, I've had a harder time lately. Um, I guess, I guess my gauge is so much like the tank is so much larger that I need to fill. Um, because like with, with work and kids and whatnot, I'm like starving for novelty. Like if I don't get something every like weekend, even if it's like just a weird random idea that I want to think about or like um, going somewhere, you know, somewhere in my area new. Um, like if it's not that, then I get really itchy. Like, like not like physically itchy, like freaking out in hives though. I might, that might be a thing. Um, I get like, I have to move. We have to move. We have to pack up the kids and we have to leave. Like, so in order to not do that, I have to keep, I have to keep the novelty going or else I do weird things like wanting to move to Hawaii, which we did. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't, it's hard to have enough of that. <laughs> I feel like such a freaking nature. I'm like all the time, all the time I need it. Uh, but yeah, it, it doesn't feel like enough, especially in this, in this stretch of life where I'm at, where I, I can't, um, up and go as, as much as I would like. If you want variety in your life, just find the right EP and you will have it. <laughs> Do you mind if I step out really quick to tuck in my kids and then I'll be back? Yeah. Okay. Sure. We can just also, I can just cut out the the pause when Amanda's not here. I, I edit all of these after. So like whenever there's dead space, I just take it out too. So, so we can just say and do whatever we want right now in these precious few minutes. Yeah, and Jonathan's just thinking, I want to fix that fridge. I want to fix that fridge. <laughs> I'm trying not to think about that. I'm trying to be present. That's <laughs> yeah, it's 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 that in the the other work emails I didn't get back, get didn't finish up before I took off work today. So uh -huh. yeah. Oh, that's so responsible of you. Email responsibility, being on time, yeah, being responsible being a good person and fixing things. Yeah. <laughs> He's trying to make you think of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, get out of my head. <laughs> I always do that. My goodness. I, I love playing the whole game of like, do you remember, do you remember this time you did this this one time and everybody, all my friends groan and they throw something at me or hate me. It's like, yeah, I remember that one time you did this and you said this, remember you said this this one time and I get a kick out of it, but they definitely don't. <laughs> That's how you tease people. You jab people with their past. <laughs> it up. The I'm power of about, SI. It is true, the power of SI. So what is everyone's sense of humor here? 
What do you find funny? I love ridiculous. Just completely ridiculous. It's my favorite. What do you mean by ridiculous? Uh, like just so absurd, like so, um, just that, that like so illogical that it's like hilarious. Like it's just nothing makes sense and it's funny. Um, and also dark, like taking things that shouldn't be funny and making them funny. Um, like, uh, uh, <laughs> so five, five years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And then two days after that, I was making cancer jokes. Like it was nothing. Um, because that face that Jonathan just made, that does it for me. Like that, like so funny it's just so funny um and so yeah that i was dropping jokes like because the reaction from people like jonathan bless your heart was just too good to not do it you know what i find not funny <laughs> cancer jokes <laughs> well when the cancer patient makes the joke, it's okay. When the non-cancer patient makes the joke, it's not okay from my point of view. But I, I, it is kind of funny though. I've been, I have been told many times through my life that I take things too seriously, right? Because I got these social rules. There's things okay to say and things not okay to say. It doesn't matter what the context is. And if it has the potential of hurting somebody's feelings or excluding or marginalizing somebody, that's not funny to me, right? That's the antithesis of my existence. So, but I, I, I get it. I mean, I, I'm, you know, the, I understand that people think that's stuff funny, but so, which means though, like that takes out all that dark humor that Amanda's talking about where I, I'm learning to appreciate that other people appreciate it, but it still makes me really uncomfortable. I like dad jokes. Puns are funny to me. And I, I you know, I like Bugs Bunny and, and I like, I like funny situational humor, like watching um, a cerebral sitcom like Cheers or, or Seinfeld or something like that. And you see situational humor where people are almost caricatures of the way people really are. And that becomes, that becomes funny because it, it's, it's, a, it's real, but it's poking fun at just everybody's imperfection as opposed to, you know, bringing out the dark side or, um, potentially, you know, like I said, pushing somebody to the side or marginalizing people. Do you get sympathy embarrassment? Like, uh, like I can't watch shows like, um, like I love Lucy or sometimes I love the office, but sometimes the office will do it to me where I'm just like, I'm so embarrassed for that person. I just, I can't, I can't do it. I see I to, like, nodding. the room. <laughs> You know what? I do a little bit, but it's just a tinge. And I actually kind of enjoy that because it push, it pushes me into a space that it, there's the novelty, right, Joyce, that you talked about before. It pushes me into a space that's really, um, but it's not so much that it's, you know, they're, they're, it's not real. And I, and I recognize that it's not real. So no, that, that stuff doesn't bother me as much. I, I'm really curious, though, how Spacey feels because there's somebody else in my life that's the same type as him and they hate that type of stuff. Um, they'll get up and leave the room, right? If something is overly cheesy or the, the dramatic pause is too much, the, the, the gooey stuff in a, in a love film or something like that, like he'll blush and he'll leave the room. And I'm kind of curious, Spacey, how, how you are with that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, I understand the impulse to like, like you said, blush during the gooey scene and like get up and leave or whatever. But I've always just kind of sucked it up and sat through it. Um, I'm not really, I'm not that dramatic, you know? Um, when it comes to something like The Office, I I can watch that. Like sometimes it's funny to me, you know, I'll say that it, I don't, I don't find it quite as humorous as a lot of other people seem to, but it's not like it offends me. Um, I don't really get the sympathy embarrassment thing too badly either. Although I, I have experienced it a little bit. 
Um, I guess I'm kind of with Amanda. I like humor that's like, you know, extremely like absurd and surreal and I guess psychological to the point where it's, it's all just a big mind fuck and it has to be pushing some kind of boundary, whether it's, you know, what's acceptable socially or what's considered offensive or whatever, chances are, yeah, it has to be pushing into dangerous territory to be really amusing to me. All the TP types, the ENTP, INTP, ESTP, and the ISTP, they tend to have dark humor, like very, very, very dark and offensive humor. And it's because they can take it. There's nothing innately offensive. It's almost like going into certain thought territories is not inherently offensive. In fact, it's, it's amusing to stretch logic in certain ways or to think about things in a certain way that other people may view as taboo, whereas it's entertaining for the TP to go that dark. <laughs> and sometimes like if they're an ENTP or ESTP or maybe all TPs, they, they like to see the reaction. It's like, ha ha, that face, I, it's priceless. <laughs> and there's just something so fun, like when something is so dumb, it's funny. It's like, oh, it's so dumb. It's even more funny because it's so, so dumb. <laughs> um, Roger, what's your sense of humor? I'm trying to think about it, but I think in all honesty, like what Amanda has been saying, I think those kind of like far out humor, maybe even dark humor are the ones that I don't expect. I have no expectation of. There's a novelty element to it that surprises me and gets a laugh out of me. I have a lot of appreciation for dad jokes, love dad jokes, love corny jokes. I I love all of the puns and will say and do them. Um, but something that's really far out or something that's within like outside of my expectations will definitely get a big laugh out of me, like out of like total shock and surprise. Um, but I appreciate a lot of different kind of humor. Um, but yeah, interestingly enough, I think like what Amanda was saying, that's kind of more like what'll actually get like a big emotional reaction out of me. Cool. And so how easy is it for you to be funny? To yourself or to others? Oh. I think I'm hilarious all the time. Others, not so much. I don't think I'm funny. And I don't think most people think I'm funny. It's And honestly, it's one of those things where I just had to come to terms with the fact that I'm not as entertaining as I'd like to be. Oh, well. I think you're entertaining, Jonathan. Not like that. <laughs> if you think, you know, apologizing for all ESFJs in the world is funny, then I'm entertaining. There we go. <laughs> I mean, I do think that's funny. I, I don't know about... Because <laughs> everything when it comes to entertainment is always based on the context of who I'm surrounded with. Um, I think generally I would consider myself funny, but that's because from what others have told me outside of other expectations, I mean, I guess maybe I can be, but it's not something that I can just like randomly do out of nowhere, I think. In a context, if I find something really funny, I will definitely say something, try to feel out the vibe, try to see what, how other people take it, what are my boundaries, what I can say. Um, but Generally, I try to understand who I'm with before making those kind of jokes and typically get a laugh or two from other people and such. So, and I'll adjust. If I know that I'm like with Amanda, I'm going to make all of the dark humor <laughs> jokes I possibly can, I can think about and definitely share. Um, but if I'm like with Jonathan, I'm going to talk all about those dad jokes and I'm going to be so happy on that. So it, it all just depends on who I'm with. So you're going to be F.E. moldable, depending on the person. <laughs> I mean, I think it's pretty easy for me to be funny. I think I make pretty much everyone laugh. I mean, obviously, I have to feel out. Because, I mean, I like to, my humor is, like, really kind of dry and blunt, I guess. And, it, you know, it's usually kind of supposed to be, like, shock humor or something that maybe somebody else wouldn't say, and that's part of why it's funny. Um, so, you know, I do have to, like, feel out my, I have to know my audience so that I know what maybe I could say that they'll probably find funny. And, you know, that takes a little while sometimes. But that's part of why I like working with, like, blue-collar people because they're usually really rough, and they will pretty much say anything to each other. So it's pretty fun. 
the skill of like scoping out your audience before you tell jokes, that was something I had to learn. I remember my mom said like, Amanda, that's not funny to everybody. I'm like, well, it doesn't matter if I find it funny. <laughs> so I had to, that's, that is something I, I had to develop later. And I would say fairly recently. <laughs> But I do like to make people laugh a lot. It's actually, I guess, one of like the main things that I enjoy in social interactions, I guess, is like laughing with people. So I, I think that's interesting because I would say one of my favorite things in social interactions is laughing with people as well, but not me making them laugh. I like laughing with at them or with them. I guess not at them. That would be the opposite, actually, of what I'm trying to do. But I love I love being able to extrovertedly appreciate somebody and show that in a way like laughing at their joke. Um, I, I think that when you, when you find something that's funny together and all of a sudden now, even though you can be totally different than each other, all of a sudden you've kind of come together on something, even if it's just a little pinpoint, right? And that's that's an awesome experience for me. I mean, those those are the sort of things that lift me up and will carry me through hard things. I mean, with, without a doubt, I can be super duper do. And maybe I don't know, maybe everybody experiences, but I'll get really, really stressed out. I'll be very serious for a while because things are really weighing on me. And I mean, then my daughter will come in and she'll say something completely outlandish and it will just cut me up and I'll laugh and then we'll be silly and all of a sudden, I just feel so much better. And it's not just because I had the stress relief, but because now I connected with somebody too, and um, who's, who's a lot different than me and made up a joke I could have never even thought of making up. Um, so it's like, it's almost like I get to borrow how cool and funny other people are and just kind of slip into that and experience it. I, re I love that. Yeah, the funniest types tend to be the EP types. So the ENTP, ENFP, ESFP, ESTP. They have a very off the cuff kind of sometimes presentation of their humor. And it can be kind of a quick, quick comebacks or like quick how they would return back a thought because <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. Whereas like the SE dominant types tend to have more of an observational humor and the NE dominant types tend to have a more like outlandish idea humor. <laughs> That's really, really cool. So Amanda was talking about earlier how she had to learn to be a little bit more tactful with her jokes because she was like, well, if I'm making it for me, I still find it funny. <laughs> Whereas I think the SFJs might have a little bit of the opposite problem. They, they understand the social sphere a lot or how it's going to come across to other people or land with other people to the point that it sometimes stops the, the joke from coming out because you have these socially appropriate filters that make it harder to be in touch with that initial TI humor inside. That kind of sounds like what Roger was explaining, how he can really morph his sense of humor to match the people that he's with. And it's very natural for him. Like, I mean, he's not having to sit down and make notes about the people that he's with, right? And then, you know, make a decision tree on what's the right joke for these people. It's very natural for him to do that. I thought actually the way he explained that was perfect. And that, that seems to match what you're saying. Yeah. And so thank you everyone for coming out today and shedding light on the perspective of your type and how it fits in with other types that share your cognitive functions. It's nice to see the SFJs really respecting the FE social atmosphere and making sure that other people have a good time, that their emotions, thoughts and feelings and their well-being is being taken care of. And so there's this huge considering other people before doing anything aspect. So Jonathan, he's done an interview with Personality Hacker, and you said this amazing saying, if the group wins, I win. And so you have, you have this huge heart for people, this huge heart for humanity. You really want to contribute something positive, like everything you leave is a net positive to people's lives, or you try your best to be. If there was a grade for treating other people well and thinking about other people and trying to get their needs met, you'd get the highest highest caliber of whatever rating score that would be. <laughs> the excellent, superb, above and beyond. 
It's like when those teachers give you a grade that's above 100%, it's like 110% you care about people and their well-being and their quality of life. And you always add to it whenever you can. It's like you're very people-centric. <laughs> Roger's like leaving in the private chat. Do teachers do that? Well, sometimes they do. I've, I think, I, I don't know, a teacher one day would, I don't know, <laughs> that teacher that breaks the rules. That's funny. So I, lo I love how Rogers, his Effie is polite. And then so it's like, oh, you know, I, I might not say this joke out loud because I don't want to ruin what's happening right now. And so Roger puts a joke in the side chat. So it's still being funny, but respecting like whatever FE atmosphere there is or SI precedence to the situation. It's really nice and respectful. And I'm totally fine with you guys joking out loud too, but I think it's late for me to tell you guys at the end of the panel. <laughs> and so Jonathan, thanks for always caring about people's emotions and you're always like a big group hug in a person. And you tend to change yourself to be the best person for the situation or for the people around you. And so you're like, if that person needs that for their needs to be met, you're willing to shift a little or adapt a little to meet their needs better. The ESFJ is sometimes called the hostess with the mostest because they have that heart for taking care and meeting people's needs around them and getting them together or helping them along their path or just like helping them. <laughs> so cool. Well, that's, Joyce, that's really kind of you to say, there's a whole nother side of needs that the world has that um, that thinkers and um, non-judgers <laughs> offer to the world. Um, and and I, I just have to add in there, I really appreciate that those people are in the world to make up the difference because there's certain honesty and, 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 and rationale that people like me can't bring um, because it's, it's just so, it's not our native space to do that. It takes a lot of work to do that. And so we, we, we need the, you know, the Spacey's and Amanda's and, um, you know, and the other people in our world that, that, that bring that piece, those, those the outlying elements and that really that honesty um, and that ability to be really open to things that are outside the box um, I, that's, that's what fills in all those gaps, I think. Anyway, I just felt like I needed to say something because you're talking too much about me. And so, yeah, yeah. The next know. five minutes are all about you, Jonathan. Sorry. This, yep. this is, yeah, <laughs> all eyes are on you. Where is that go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a part of the joke component. I'm seeing how long I can make you uncomfortable. So. Yeah. And it's not, <laughs> it's, and to be clear, it's not the attention. I don't, I don't mind people listening to me and, and seeing me for what I am. But it's, I, I certainly don't want to aggrandize what an ESFJ brings to the world because I really, and, and I guess I'll just add this, something I've learned in studying typology and, and watching the journey that my wife has been on as she has basically honed a skill of typing people and finding their strengths um, as, you know, as, as a coach and a profiler is that all of these different functions in their order, assuming that we're in a healthy place, right? I mean, because there's always unhealthy places too. They, everybody brings something that is so important to the world being successful and to everybody fitting in and being effective and having value. Um, and if we, I, I really think, and, and I see this in the typology communities from the outside, because I don't really consider myself an insider. Um, but as I watch from the outside, there tended there tends to be a lot of intuitive bias inside type communities, and um, you know a lot of bashing on sensors and things like that. And, and I'm stereotyping, right? Um, and, and I realize that I'm kind of painting a broad brush, but I just think it's so important to recognize that all 16 types and all the variations of those 16 types, um, because there are many variations inside every type. Um, there's so much that they that they have to offer and that the world just would not be the same without, if you just picked one out, it really wouldn't. And I'm not, this isn't lip service. Literally, I've really learned this over the last few years. And it's been um, it's been eye-opening and and really beneficial to me. Uh, I, I feel like it's it's a growth place, you know, for me to see that. I love the the term of uh, personality ecosystem. Um, because like 
that's what it is. That's what's so great about this particular um, type of personality typology um, that I find uh, very helpful is because like there is, there is a place for every type, a needed place for every type, because we all contribute to the ecosystem, you know, if you will. And, um, and it's, it's so true. And I love it because um, even the people that I used to have a harder time with, like, just, I don't, I don't even know what to do with you. Like um, now, like, like I know, like there, there is like, everybody is bringing something to the table. There's a space, a needed space for everybody. And I, th I think that's just really great. Um, it's a great thing that I've learned using the system. So I, t I typically do compliments at the end of my panels and I noticed with, okay, so this has happened with the ESFJs, ENTPs, and even with the INTP panels where they'll get uncomfortable with me just complimenting them. And then they'll feel the need to like compliment everyone else in the room. And I'm like, is that F-E-N-E? -E? That F-E is like looking at everyone's feelings or everyone's needs. And then the N-E is like, well, I can see all the possibilities of everyone else and how awesome that they are too. And I, I do think everyone else in the, in the panel is awesome. Um, but I noticed that trend with that specific needing to diffuse the, the complimenting that's it, happened. It could, Joyce, it could very well be um, some TI as well, because there's, there's, it's illogical, right, to, for, for one type to be better than any other type, right? And so all of those pieces kind of come together. Um, anyway, I'm just throwing out there as a thought that there, 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 well, there could be a TI play. Obviously not implying that anyone's better than anyone else because she has to compliment everybody. I don't know, Spacey. I didn't get complimented, so. <laughs> that's because I interrupted Joyce before she got there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I, I compliment everyone, but I try to point out specifically what you provide so I don't see them as generic compliments. I'm actually like being TI analytical about it. Like I'm kind of giving you my logic as I'm explaining to you the compliment. Because what I would say to you is not something I would say to someone else. And I try to like make sure I do that. It's kind of like on, on some hand, giving people gifts on Christmas does take away some of the the kindness of the gift because you're giving it on a holiday and it's like, well, it's customary. You're doing it during the holiday season, but the Christmas gifts can still mean something because the Christmas gift is customized to that person. And so I find that the customization is what is to me nice. The reason why I compliment people after the panels is because I, I think that it's also nice to know what people appreciate you for. So I'm kind of like letting you know what other people see in you as well. So it's not just my view, but I really think that you you offer this to the world. It's it's it, like it's also in line with my spiritual practice too. So it's kind of like I see everyone as an amazing person in different ways. They offer something like Amanda said to the personality ecosystem. And so I want to be able to acknowledge that. So it's not just like, it's not just to me a superficial compliment. It's, it goes layers deeper into like spiritual significance and um, what it means in the way that I view you and how others view you and what I think people should know about themselves before they die. So I think a lot into the end state of things. So I'm thinking about how would you be if you died without knowing that these are the certain traits that the world appreciates you for? So it, it's kind of morbid, but like to me, that's why I view it as non-superficial, but I can understand why it's also superficial too, but it's oh, just it's no. I understand why you do it, and I don't. I don't think it's superficial. It's just not spontaneous. It's, yeah, it's it's definitely not spontaneous. <laughs> so okay, yeah. Oh yes, <laughs> you're right. 
about that, Spacey. We're going to expect compliments at the beginning, in the middle, at the end. <laughs> They're with your coffee and your donut. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want them to forget. Yeah, it's true. It's interesting how in a panel full of SI users, it's likely for them to not want to break the SI precedence. Because I didn't tell you guys whether or not you could joke during the panel. And I realized that it caused like a, a, a sometimes like you guys to joke in the side chat. So it's like respecting like, I don't know what the SI is here. So I'm just going to like play it safe and like comment on the side thing. And I'm like, huh, I should have told you guys that it's okay to to joke casually. <laughs> and so I was like, huh, interesting. Um, yeah, back on track. Um, otherwise we'll be here all night and day. <laughs> and so Spacey, thanks for coming out and for participating in these panels. And it's always nice to hear your NE ideas. And you're always bringing this unique perspective to how you view type because you'll, learn type from every single source imaginable on the internet or that you can find. I don't know if you find like this, these esoteric random MBTI or socionic books lying around that no one else has ever read to. Like you really like to bottom out on every single source that you can find. That's good. And you'll learn as much as possible from those sources. And so your consuming of information and your ability to have a quirky perspective from combining them in very nuanced ways creates a very interesting take on type two, which is why I think my viewers love having you on. So whenever I hold an INTP video and it doesn't have Spacey, people will sure as heck comment in the comment section and go like, where's Spacey? So you do have a fan club and they're very appreciative of the comments that you leave. Even the, the harsh, brutal honesty of your comments <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> too. They're, they're appreciated. You're quick to call out when things are stupid or don't make sense. And it's good because some things really just don't make sense. And we should have someone who is willing to say it out loud or even notices or really prioritizes the truth like you do, because seldom people do. And so it's good to have someone who is a truth seeker looking for the accuracy in something and pursuing it. Your mind can't help but filter things through what makes sense or not. You have been a very awesome BS detector too, because whenever you think things are BS, you'll message me and you're like, Joyce, that's BS, that thing over there. And you'll explain to me why it doesn't make sense. And that's good because it refines my logic and my logic sword gets sharpened from that. So I really appreciate that. And so Roger, I really appreciate your involvement in these panels. You have this really great balanced view on ISFJs because you have a really well-developed introverted thinking. And I like that about you. It adds this maturity to you and it adds this ability to be really dark sometimes because you can follow the TI where the TI goes. <laughs> um, and it's very awesome how you are able to consider people's feelings. It's quite amazing how Kiersey and his book led you to us here reading about the ISFJ. You do a great job of being an admin slash moderator of the ISFJ Haven Facebook group that'll be linked below for anyone who wants to join the ISFJ wonderfulness there. And Roger is a really stand-up dude. He's really cool. And he is very balanced. Like when an issue happens, Roger is very level-headed in his approach to it. He'll be analyzing it in a very giving fair respects to all sides in his Enneagram 9 fashion. He's like, gotta make sure all sides are listened to in that it's not unfair, it doesn't meet someone's needs somewhere. And Amanda, thanks for your chaoticness <laughs> and your need for novelty and how you're always looking for new, new, new. You're always kind of searching for interesting things. These cool finds, it's almost like the whole world is a, a thrift shop and you're looking to thrift these cool ideas or these cool things from different places. You're like, oh, that's fascinating. I haven't thought about it that way before. I wonder what would happen if I said it this way to that person. 
Would they react that way? Hmm, interesting. And so your social experimentation is quite thrilling and funny. And so if people want to have a good time, relax, be playful, and really be in the presence of a jokester, <laughs> I think that they do really well in your company too. And so Amanda, I really, really appreciate that about you. It's nice to have female ENTP representation too, because a lot of ENTPs tend to, in, in the space, tend to be the male ones. And so it's good to have that balanced gender view as well. And so thanks everyone for coming out and representing your function group. And I appreciate you audience members for sitting through all of my compliment sessions, because I know it's a lot, but yeah. <laughs> thanks everyone for tuning in. I'll see you all in the next episode. Take care. Thank you.